Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, middle March here, 2024. I want to welcome you to the Forest Connect webinar series. I'm Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester and Director of the R Not Teaching and Research Forest. And the monthly webinar series is one that's been going on now for a long time, uh, close to maybe 17 years. And it's a monthly get together. We bring on a variety of different people to talk about a variety of different topics. Last month, we I gave a presentation on slash walls. This week is on a very different scale. It's a scale of the saying the small or the new woodland owner to think about best practices and activities. So it's an introduction to private woodland management. And I want to welcome you. It's particularly designed for new woodland owners or woodland owners that are just getting active in their woods and thinking about some first steps that they can take. And also extension educators and foresters that interact with those woodland owners. Um, and I hope that you, as we're going through this, if you have other ideas or thoughts or things that I missed or didn't give correct attention to, please, uh, Please feel free to drop those into the chat, and I'll look forward to reviewing those. I do have the chat kind of visible in the corner of my window. So usually I'm the host, and I'm watching the chat and the participants, but here I'm host and presenter, so it's it's drawing on me to be a little more uh, um, multitaskable, which we'll see how well I do. So let's get going. <clears throat> I want to start off by recognizing that there is, I'm making some assumptions and I want to define some terms. So first assumption is that owners, and especially you, since you're taking up some of your time, care about your woods and you want to learn more. I think that's reasonable. And I've got a selection bias in the people that I work with and, and that you know the people that want to know something are the ones that usually reach out to me. I also... Again, there's a selection bias, but the owners that I have interactions with are very attentive to what's going on. They're paying, they're looking at their woods, they're noticing things. They may not put the same name or label on the object or on the process that I do or that others do, but they're conscious of what's going on. And that's great because when you see those things, you can start piecing them together and thinking about how they work, and then you can learn more. And then eventually you'll put a name on there or a label on there that's consistent with what other people are using. You all have neighbors. Uh, that's either good or bad. I, you know, oftentimes it's good. And what I'm going to, one of the points I'm going to make here is that it's important that you talk to them sooner than later. We'll come back to that. These woodlands are an interesting overlap or blend or integration of biological, environmental, and social realities. So it'd be nice to think you're out in your woods and you're all alone and most days you are, but you are minimally you're ex minimally you're experiencing a biological presence and an environmental presence. And then there's some kind of social element as well. You may have road frontage, you have neighbors, you hear, you know, somebody moves in across the road and their kids have dirt bikes and they think that it's a shared landscape, whatever it might be, there's a lot of this that integrates, integrates together. I'm going to use the word, and I think title, I use the word woods or woodlands, so I'll use the word woods and forest, woodland interchangeably. So, just so you know. And management, I'll use the word management. Oftentimes, management appears when you're talking in forestry circles. Management is code for harvesting. Uh, harvesting is one type of management, but there are lots of other types and activities of management that don't involve cutting trees. So marking your boundaries, for example, is a type of is a management activity. And I'm going to mention safety wherever I think I can squeeze it in because I'm a big fan of safety. I want you all to be safe and uh, continue being able to come back for more future webinars. My goals, I want to share with you what I think of, so that's why I put universal in quotes, because this is 
the world according to me, but some universal woodland activities for small parcel owners and, and to frame these as a foundation for what you can then go on to do in your management as a woodland owner. Uh, and then we'll feel free to type in your questions. If you have any questions in the chat window, I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to see specific questions when they come up, but when we get to the end, we'll, we'll circle back around and we'll go through all of those questions. Let's start by asking the question, why do I think it's important to be active? Well, I think it's important because it's, or fundamentally because it's fun. And I always told my daughters growing up, you know, one of the first questions you ask yourself is why would you want to do something? And if the answer is because it's fun, make sure you explore that activity further. But it, it's fun because it allows you to learn about the ecology of trees and plants and birds and mammals and lots of other things that you're going to find in your woods. And because of that, you're informed and you make informed decisions. You start to recognize ecological relationships and how you can influence those or not, as you might so choose uh, to accomplish some end result. You'll see things at a small scale that are um, scalable to larger scales. So if you look at a stump that's rotting, you're looking at an ecosystem, but then you can also think about that stump as an ecosystem, a pond that you might have as an ecosystem that's larger, your whole woodlot that's an ecosystem, the landscape that it's in that's an e ecosystem. And the complexities change and the, the components change, but the principles are going to be uh, overlapping. So when you finally, when you're active, you're going to be able to better advance whatever it is you want to accomplish. So conservation, as I use that term, is wise use and sustainable use. And uh, if you're paying attention and you're out in your woods, then you're going to be thinking about what you can do and what you might want to do. I think a useful parallel for somebody that's new to the concept of woodland management is to think about woodland management as an an, as an analog to gardening. So they're bait, the point I'm making here is they both have high level of overlap. So in both cases, we're talking about plants. I don't say it here, but there's also a wildlife community, whether it's insects or small mammals or sometimes large mammals in your garden. And, uh, and the plants are there. You have a diversity of plants. The plants have roots. The roots go into the soil. They pull moisture and minerals out of the soil and those serve important physiological functions inside the plant, namely to allow the leaves to photosynthesize as they capture sunlight. You have plants that are both a crop, so something that you want to, that you're going to extract benefit from. It might be an aesthetic visual benefit or it might be a tangible benefit. But there are probably also weeds that are mixed in with that. So these are plants that are might in some other context be a happy plant to have, but because they're in the wrong place, then you might view them as a weed. And so whether it's in the forest or in a garden, you may decide that you need to do something about that. There are multiple outputs I've alluded to, visual outputs and productive, or I'll refer to them as tangible and non-tangible outputs. Um, you manage at whatever desired level of input you want. This garden, for those of you that garden, I think would realize that this is somebody that puts a lot of attention to their garden and, you know, and really has the, the incentive to make it look very prim and proper. And it's an attractive, I, I think at least it's an attractive um, garden. So other, other gardens might be as productive in some of their elements, but look very different. So that's your call. This is right. It's your property and it's, you have the benefit of deciding how it is you want to, uh, what it is you want to put into that. The other element of woodland management and garden management is that you have components of activities. So you have activities that relate to tending your garden. So what happens, you've already, you've established the garden. Now you're maintaining it and you're wanting to make sure that it's 
more productive or more healthy or more something, but the focus is on the current garden. And then there are other activities that are specifically about how you how do you establish the next garden. Some of that may happen in the fall as you prepare that now past overdue garden for winter and then in the spring, but those are essentially establishment activities rather than tending activities. So the first of these points I'm going to make, I think there's eight or nine points that I'll make, uh, and we'll go through them. Some of them are short and simple, others are a little bit longer. Here, are the, this is a foundation. So the three things that I want to argue are important as a foundation for a woodlot owner is to know what your objectives are, find a forester, and have a written plan. Your objectives are what you like to accomplish from your woods. So why do you like it? Why do you pay taxes on it? What do you want it to produce for you? What are the things that you do on a regular basis? So the things you might do every week or every month, what are the things you do seasonally? Um, what are the things you do once every decade or as occasion permits? And then all of those together package up as to your objectives. Um, and, and they're going to span everything from consumptive, probably from consumptive, such as firewood, to aesthetics, such as watching wildlife, to recreation, and, um, and a variety of, of other things. So, and that's fine. What's, what's, I think what's important is that you think about both the freak, think about it on a scale of frequency. So what do you often do? What do you want to retain the option to do? So you may, we'll talk later about having a timber harvest. That may be something that you have no intention of doing in the next 20 years, but you want to, you want to retain that as an option. So in that case, it's an objective. So an objective is not, you might spell them out as near term or far term, but just under the label of objectives, it's things that you want to have the opportunity to accomplish. Another important part of this is that anybody that's involved in your woods in a substantive way, so spouse, siblings, parents, children, co-owners, uh, it's important that all of you go through this process because you want, you want to see where your objectives overlap. You're going to be thinking about your property where some parts of your property may be optimal for some objectives and different parts of your property may be optimal for other objectives. You need to know what all those objectives are in order to blend them and overlay them onto your property. A forester is a great resource. There's uh, Foresters are different from loggers. Foresters are important and loggers are important. Uh, here we're talking about foresters. These include public foresters, which work for a state agency in New York. That's the New York State DEC in Pennsylvania. And I won't get all these right, but I think in Pennsylvania, it's the DCNR. Uh, and other states have different department of something or other. And these are foresters that are paid through your tax dollars. And in most states, they will show up prepaid. So you're your tax dollars at work, they'll show up prepaid and offer you um, uh, a service of consulting with you, advising you on how to proceed with your management. So foresters have professional training. They should have continuing education if you're working. If you're, you have a forester that's never been through any kind of continuing education, then after a few years out of forestry college, they're going to be missing out on some important details. They should be representing the owner, or if they're representing, so we have consulting and industrial as well on the private side. If they work for a mill, they need to be very clear about who they represent, but how they can, how they can support you if they represent an industrial mill. I think it's a good idea to have a contract. So just to spell out who's going to do what, when that's going to happen, how you're going to, you know, how payments are going to be made, the frequency of payments, whatever it might be. So contracts are great documents to have and protect everybody involved. And then I like to encourage people to write a plan. So foresters can write plans. 
uh, state agency foresters, at least in New York, and I think most of the eastern states, I think most of the United States, will write what's called a stewardship plan, which is a plan that covers the entire property. It's a voluntary document both to receive it and what you do with it afterwards. It doesn't obligate you to anything, but it's an important first step in order for you to be able to move forward, especially if you want to become involved with any cost, federal or state cost share programs. Many states require a written plan. I talk to a lot of landowners. They say, it's not written down, but it's in my head. Well, that's fine if that's the only, if they're the only person that's involved in it, they don't have to try to communicate it, but a written plan is very helpful because then if you have multiple people, they, they can all look at it, make sure that it's representative of what they, you know, their buy-in in the property. And it's also a tool that you can share with foresters or whoever might be working on your property. If you want a more, uh, uh, so, back so there's uh if a, if a state agency forester doesn't write that there is funding available for that same stewardship type plan that's available through federal cost share monies through nrcs uh in new york there's another more intensive plan called a tax law plan other states will have something similar i don't know about other states but i think in well i should be careful i'm not certain if funding is available or if that is an expense that comes out of pocket uh, for you to acquire that tax law plan. So maybe there's a New York forester on here who can um, who can share that, that, answer that question. The things that your plan is going to include are your objectives. We already talked about that. Maps of the property, descriptions of the properties, particular features of the woods that you might be interested in or that you might want to minimize. It's going to have some guidance on how to manipulate some areas from their current condition into a desired condition. So you have sections of your property. Of course, we'll refer to those, those as stands. They're management units. So you might have a pine plantation. You might have a young patch of brushy woods. You might have an old, mature sugar bush. So those are three different management units. Different things happen in there. They support objectives differently, but you may want to manipulate them so that you move them towards some alternative characteristic. And then the plan would also have prioritized but voluntary activities, except for the, the tax law plans have mandatory work schedules. But these are these are what forester thinks you should do and the sequence in which you should do them in order to accomplish whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. So what are the next steps? Involve your family. Think about what your common activities are. Um, think about what you want from your woods. What do you want that woodland to provide? It might be things like privacy, it might be revenue, it might be wildlife viewing or hunting or something. Uh, what do you want to do in the future with your woods? How do you want to engage with it? And then make sure you get a connection with a forester and get a plan and then refer to that plan. It's not just a matter of having a plan, but refer to the plan as well. Second point is to meet your neighbors. And the key here is just to establish communication. Uh, at some point, you're going to have something happen on your property or their property. And if you already know the person you know their phone number, you know how to get a hold of them, you recognize them, it's a lot easier than to start another conversation rather than saying, hey, you don't know me yet. I've been your neighbor for the last seven years. I've never taken the occasion to meet you, nor you me, but we got something we need to talk about. So just do it. It'll be uh, simple, and then it doesn't have to be long and drawn out. You don't need to take them any housewarming gifts or trays of cookies, although sometimes that bit might be a good strategy. Your goal is just to listen to them and, and you talk as well about your priorities for your properties and think about that. Think about how your property lines are, are marked. Think about whether you're going to have shared access. A lot of rural properties, they have shared access for hunting. Other rural properties don't do that. And that's, you know, that's your call. It's your land. You can decide even if 
your neighbor says, well, the previous owner always used to let us hunt and that's okay. You're not the previous owner. So you, you decide how you want to do that. And know that there may be some things that you're going to learn that could signal potential for conflict. You decide if you want to talk about them then. Usually it's good to at least mention that that's something you want to think about more before you take any action on it, just so that it's on their radar, something that's different from just business as usual. Part of having good neighbors is having good boundaries. Here's some examples of different ways to post your or to mark your boundary lines. You can see in the left, the tree was blazed and then painted. Once a, um, and I was once talking to a surveyor who said, once you have a blaze like that, don't reblaze it. That's a historic marker, a blaze. You can reblaze it below it or above it as the tree starts to get older. You can repaint the blaze, but don't, don't rescar that same location. In New York, there's, there's maybe less advantage to posting your property than you might think. So a posted sign is not going to keep, keep people off your property necessarily. It'll keep, it'll keep honest people off of your property. It's not going to protect you from liability. So if you're thinking you're protected from liability by posting, that's not the case. Um, what you can do is put up a posted sign and then put a little sticker. In New York, the DEC has these stickers that say, ask the owner. And it's just a friendly way of saying, hey, this is my property. If you want to come onto my property, come talk to me. I want to know that you're here. And that usually, that's a pretty good signal. Other states probably have something similar. But whatever you do, mark your boundary. Now, one way is you can hire a surveyor to come in and serve your boundary. That can get expensive. The other thing you could do is go out with your neighbor. And before you do this, you go out on the ground and you figure out where you think the property line is and then walk that boundary with your neighbor and you can just stand there and make an in the field agreement as to where you want to recognize that boundary line and then if you mark it over time it will become i'm guessing some kind of a historic at least a historic uh precedent if not uh, become the actual boundary line now be careful with that you might lose property if you don't know where you're standing so you decide whether or not you want to go the surveyor route or the sit and chat with your neighbor route. So get a map of your property, make a list of your neighbors and how you want to contact them. Go out and look and see if you can find any kind of markers that indicate the presence of corners and edges and boundaries and such. Learn the flora. There we have pictures of native species on the left and non-native species on the right. The native species are more often than not desirable. And when I say desirable, as, as I was preparing this presentation, I've given this now a couple of times this spring, I thought I would define desirable. Feel free to argue with me or counter negotiate different terms. But when I think about desirable plants, it has some combination of these attributes it's i'll say it's ecologically cooperative that means it's not going to come in it's not going to dominate a habitat and take it over it's aesthetic uh, beauties in the eye of the beholder of course but it just has something pleasing now just as a caveat with this i look at most plants and i think most of them have something about them that's aesthetically pleasing so this is maybe a bit of a low bar it has some kind of benefit for wildlife either the fruit or some part of the plant, and then it has some utilization. I'm, I'm, I'm prone towards utilization, so I like things that might have firewood or timber, or I can whittle spoons out of them, or make chair legs, or something or other. So you get the idea. So you're going to have desirable plants. You're going to have interfering plants. So these are maybe native species that impede your ownership objectives. This is a picture of a beach understory and there's other species like striped maple and hop hornbeam that are native species but that can dominate uh, and, and it impedes access and impedes visibility it may impede some other things that are uh, that you're interested in now 
that doesn't mean they don't also have some benefits. So when I look at this and I think, all right, there's beach and I like to have a smoker you know, and I like to smoke, you know, different cuts of meats on the weekend. And so beach is one of my preferred smoker woods, easy to handle these small stems. You just cut them into the correct lengths, dry them a little bit, and they're ready to go into the smoker. And then we have invasive plants. So the invasive plants also are interfering, but they're invasive because they're non-native and they cause problems. Two examples, uh, although I <laughs> I forgot to change this. Uh, so the picture on the left is European buckthorn. The picture on the right says it's European buckthorn, but it's really um, barberry. And you can see the person in the middle of the barberry, that's a it's an adult standing in that barber. That's a picture from Jeff Ward out of Connecticut. These are these are plants that 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 failed, first of all, that fail the test for being ecologically cooperative. They come in, they dominate. They may have attributes. Some of them have characteristics that just make them unfriendly. Uh, the barberry on the right is associated with um rodents that carry deer ticks that have a higher incidence of the pathogen that causes Lyme disease. So there's more of the rodents, more ticks on the rodents, and more a higher percentage of those ticks have Lyme disease. So there's a lot about these plants that we love to hate, and it's um, they're just but they're in the mix. So you need to be able to identify them. Many of these invasive plants have native species that might look like them that are not at all problematic. So before you go out and get your jug of of plant be gone or brush be gone or whatever mixture it is you're using, make sure you identify it so you don't kill something you really should be trying to save. These interfering plants often are the result of deer. And that's because deer have um, uh, a documented need for the amount of forage that they need. So they need on average about seven pounds per day of fresh weight. When the when a deer eats its plants in the forest, it's not gonna eat the whole plant like you might think of, but it's just gonna nip the ends and it might take off an inch or so of the end from these twigs. And there are about 600 seedling tips. So if you look at this ash seedling on the right, 600 seedling tips per pound, that makes about 4,200 seedling tips per deer per day. So this is potentially, so you, magnif you can do the math from there. Let's say you have one deer and three or four months out of the year, it, it wanders over to your neighboring farmer's alfalfa field, but the rest of the year it's on your property and in your neighbor's property. How many seedling tips is it going to eat over the course of eight months? And then you don't, probably have just one deer but you have many more deer and so you can you can see and i make the argument many people make the arguments and certainly not just me i've learned from others that this is a really destructive force in your woods so um be alert to that look for plants like this as an indication of of a deer problem so what are your next steps learn how to identify plants I'm giving you these next steps and at the very last slide I'm going to give you some guidance on where you can go to for some of the educational resources. Um, make a species list and that would be not just plant species but birds and mammals and fungi and whatever else is of interest to you. Make an insect collection. Learn the ecology of each of those or certainly the ones maybe maybe say what are the ones that are most common or most important or most useful. So pick some way. You're not going to, unless you do this full time, you're not going to learn the ecology of all the plants and all the organisms in your woods, but you can, you know, set out to do one a month, maybe and by the end of the year, you're, you're 12 deep and you've got a lot more knowledge than what you had before. Think about concerns as they relate to your objectives. If you're going to treat something like the swallowwort pictured, use veg integrated vegetation management. If you have a deer problem, or if you don't know if you have a deer problem, we've developed a protocol called aviddeer.com. There's a website, there's a phone app, and AVID stands for Assessing the Vegetation Impacts of Deer. 
one of the most common calls that I get relates to tree health. And people go out in the woods and they'll see something, they love their trees. And for the owners that have, you know, certainly just a few acres and, and even for some owners that have a hundred acres, you may not have your trees named, but you know, individual trees and you keep track of them and you see how they're doing and you wonder what's happening. And you're going to see things that would be signs of a problem. And those are diagnostics. So the picture on the left is a sugar maple sapling that has sugar maple borer damage to it. So we know because of the specifics of that injury, we can say that's a sugar maple borer. On the right, we see dieback and crowns. So these are suggestive because it's it's unclear what specifically caused that dieback to happen. So that makes it a symptom versus a sign. And it's useful to think about those terms. You look at a dieback in the tree, you need to do some investigative work and say what's happening with that. If you see signs or symptoms, start by thinking to yourself that you likely don't have an overwhelming problem. This is not something you need to panic about. If your palms start sweating, then dry them off. You've got, uh, you've got time to learn what's going on and make a deliberate, informed decision. So it can, and you can make that solution, come up with that solution over several weeks or a couple of months. Many of these disease agents have common symptoms. I just showed you that. Uh, and the organism that you see is often not what's causing the problem. So the picture here is a stump that has armillaria root rot, which is also known as shoestring root rot, which can be both a, um, a decomposer as well as a parasitic, um, be a problematic plant as well as a responsive plant. So you need to think about when the problem happened and um, when the, uh, what, what you're seeing, whether it's responding to the same injury that you're seeing or if it's causing that injury. Look at individual trees. Think about the patterns. I had a class that I teach. We went to visit a maple producer. Um, he's a great, he produces delicious maple syrup. And I go out and see him every two years when I teach the class. And we showed up and I said, how's your sugar bush doing? He says, oh, I've got trees that are dying. We're standing on the edge of the sugar bush and I'm looking up in the crowns of the trees. So this is last month. So there's no foliage. The crowns look good, nice, fine branching. And I'm not seeing anything that, that makes me think that there's a problem, but I'm in a rare moment of prudence, I keep my mouth shut and say, all right, well, let's just go for a walk in the woods. And we went in with a class and we'll see what we see. We get deep into the sugar bush and we're looking around. And he said, look here. He says, look at these trees that are dying. So to give you a sense of this woods, it's, uh, he usually doesn't, he doesn't do any thinning in here. So it's a closed canopy, high densities of stems. The average tree diameter is probably... 12 to 14 inches, and he was looking at two four-inch diameter stems that had died. And it was, it was, you know, it was the pattern here was obviously that these are young trees. They had been suppressed. They had not been getting sunlight, and eventually they died. And so what he was seeing was a problem had a reasonable explanation. So you may not be able to explain it, but look for the pattern, and then when you talk to people, you'll be able to, to think through those solutions or explanations at least. There are certainly things that we need to be worried about. Most of you have heard about these uh, three very common pests, Asian longhorn beetle, still around. It doesn't have near the news, um, news interest, if you will, that some of these others have. Uh, it's not contained my knowledge, but it's not as much of a threat maybe as, as it used to be, though it probably could come back. Emerald ash borer EAB is throughout actually all of New York and it's in the east and it's having devastating effects on ash. 
Hemlock woolly adelgid started in the southern Appalachians has spread north over the last decades, and it similarly is having a lot of um, mortality in some now in some parts of not all, but some parts of New York. Beech leaf disease is a big one that I'm very worried about. Um, and spotted lanternfly gets a lot of publicity because it's seen sometimes in these urban areas and, and urban dwellers need to react to that. I'm not hearing from a forestry perspective. I haven't heard yet that this is going to be something of concern. So maybe it will be, but that's not really, not that I've seen not materialized. There are a lot of forest health resources. If you uh, go to my website, which is forestconnect.info, you can find those on a couple of different pages. You can also go to the Forest Connect YouTube channel, which you see on the right. Just do a search for health, and you'll see or search for, I think, most of the common pests. We have um, had webinars on. I'm trying to. So here's a Here's a request for you all that are listening. I want to have somebody talk about beech leaf disease. So if you know somebody that's out in front on the research side of this, that can, that can tell a, uh, an informed story about beech leaf disease, please send me an email or put it in the chat or something like that. We also have the Healthy Woods phone app. So this was um, Ellen Crocker from the University of Kentucky led a group of um, forest extension, forestry managers and specialists and health specialists in the Eastern U.S. And we put together a phone app called Healthy Woods that's available for iPhones and Androids. So breathe, relax, take a look at what the trees um, are doing, how they're performing, walk in your woods, pay attention to what you're seeing, take notes, take pictures. We have an annual kind of annual photo points that you can look back at and see how your woods is changing over time. And then think about just because you have some kind of a dead tree and dead trees are common, you're always going to have something die in your woods. But think about those relative to your objectives. For some ownership objectives, not for all, for some of them, you're going to, those objectives will be benefited if you increase the amount of growing space, which is the amount of sunlight that some of these trees have. So the trees on the left have very little growing space. You can see by the shapes and sizes of the crowns that they're congested, they're tight together. The tree on the right has been opened up. It's been some different words. It's opened up, it's released, it's thinned. And that tree crown top of the stem where all the branches are, that tree crown has lots of access to sunlight. With, um, I think with maybe no exceptions, the tangible outputs, the things that we like, whether these are acorns or lumber or foliage, um, these tangible outputs all increase as a result of increased tree growth. So the more the tree is growing, the better the outputs of those tangible products are. Why do we want healthy trees? Why do we want vigorous trees? What we're doing is we're concentrating growth on the desired stems so you get more of what you like. So if you're growing those trees, you can, um, and they're producing what you want, they're going to produce more of what you like. So you're, you're trying to optimize on a per acre basis, not on a per tree basis. So on a per tree basis, you might have just a couple of trees, but what you're wanting to do are to say, here are all of these trees that have these different features that I want to enhance. And so we're going to make sure all of them have an increase of light, maybe not maximizing light, but optimizing light. You're able to, to capture some of the mortality before it becomes mortality. You can pick some of those trees that have insect and disease problems, cut them down, reduce the incidence or the proportion of stems that have these problems. And then for any of your goals that are size related, so that might be an economic output, volume output, seed production, aesthetics, the size of the crowns or old growth characteristics. Um, Paul Catanzaro and Tony D'Amato have a nice uh, publication out on 
creating old growth structure, which is an aesthetic thing, but it's about how you grow those trees. All of these are a relationship to tree growth, which is related to tree health. There are different ways that you can assess this. There's a webinar that goes all through these details. I'll just show this and you can read down through them, but just know there are different ways that you can determine whether or not you need to thin your woods. One way to thin your woods is a technique that's known as crop tree management. If you do a Google search on crop tree management, the Forest Service has been um, providing fact sheets and many extension systems have fact sheets on this. But you basically identify your ownership objectives, which you've already done back in our step number one today. You know what you want. And from that, you can say, here's what I want as a crop tree. It's, I want to point out here that when we use the word, when foresters use the word crop tree, that's a crop for in the future. It's not what you're cutting down now. So it's not like you're harvesting the apple crop. This is, uh, other people refer to this as best tree management. So you're growing your best trees. And what you're, with this, it's a thinning activity. It's like tending the carrots in your garden. You're making sure that they have plenty of sunlight. You're going to go out and do walk about in your woods, take some notes about the types of trees that you see, uh, make sure you know whether you have lots of, you know, so any the species that are there, know which ones you have a lot of, which ones you have few of, what condition they're in, and you're focusing on the best trees. So you may have black cherry, it's not great looking black cherry, but it's the best that you have, so that may be what you want to include in this mixture. And you're going to mark somewhere between 50 to 70 of these per acre. Now that's on a per acre basis, but you might do this. You might say, okay, I'm going to start in the corner of my woods and I'm going to mark five of the best trees. And then that's your starting point. So you don't have to do an acre. You certainly don't have to do 20 acres. And that's what makes this really powerful for woodland owners that are getting started is that they can take a little test the waters and see what they're, you know, see what they're biting off and whether or not they can chew it. And then simply what you do is you cut or otherwise kill those trees whose crown touches your crop tree crown. The subordinate trees, the trees that are lower than the height of your crop tree, don't matter. If you want to cut them, cut them. If you don't want to cut them, then don't cut them. It's up to you. Here's what it looks like as a schematic. The crop tree is in the center. You would think about the crop tree as having the crown as having four sides and then the FTG is free to grow. So you're going to get your, typically you're going to get the best growth if you do a four-sided release. But as the trees get much larger, as they get above 12 or 14 inches, you may be cutting some large trees, which has two implications. One, it could be even more dangerous, cutting a six inch tree can be dangerous, but the bigger the tree, the, the, the more complicated it can get. And some of those trees might have some value. So this is where you, it's good to have a conversation with your forester. So I usually don't think about doing a four-sided release unless the average trees that I'm working with, the crop trees are less than about 10 inches in diameter. And then I might do it above that. I might do a two-sided release. Another consideration with a four-sided release is you're going to put a lot of sunlight on the forest floor and you can have an unintended consequence like an explosion of blackberry canes. Now if you want to feed songbirds this is great. If you want to go for evening walks in the woods this is not as much fun so be careful what you ask for you might just get it. So the next steps we're talking about cutting down trees I think you, if you're running a chainsaw, it's crazy to not take the game of logging in New York. Send an email to chainsawsafety at bassett.org. Uh, most of the Eastern U.S. has game of logging opportunities, so figure out who in your state does that. Read up about crop tree management. Flag some trees as cut versus leaves. Leave trees and bring your forester out and have your forester talk with you um, about the decisions that you've made. And also, it's fun to measure tree growth. So New York has a program as well. It's the Northeast Program for Timber Growing Contest. You can learn more about that at timbercontest.org.
www.ethicalcoachingcenter.com. I encourage you to find some kind of a productive output. And here I'm showing fairly substantive outputs, and we'll talk about several of these very quickly. Uh, you could have something of a photo collection of pictures of wildflowers as a productive output. So something that's you're engaged with that is a physical representation of what you enjoy about your property. That's really what I'm trying to convey. In all of these pursuits, because you're acquiring something, some physical, tangible output, safety is essential. If you're out in the woods, you need to worry about ticks and poisonous plants. I don't know where you're from. Um, most of the mid-Atlantic and at least southern New England have ticks, and many of those ticks carry Lyme disease. And if you get those of you that have Lyme disease or have had Lyme disease, know what that the discomfort of that. And it can be very serious if it's untreated. So um, figure out there's different ways to manage it. That'd probably be another good webinar to have is on managing ticks and woodlands. And the poisonous plants are not as common and, and because they don't like seek you out as, as ticks do. But poison ivy is the old favorite standby. And then we have some other newer ones that are more oriented towards roadside ditches, but be alert to those. And anything that's able to injure you directly that you handle, chainsaws, machines, drills, and hot wax, like if you're doing um, inoculating mushrooms. So all of these have occasions where there's the right way to use them and the wrong way to use them. They all have some kind of personal protective equipment and personal protective behaviors. You need to learn what those are and, and then do it, right? This is not your chance to be an optimist this is your chance to be a realist and say i love what i'm doing in the woods and i want to keep doing it so be safe firewood's great it's actually one of the most common things that people do uh, as woodland owners in new york the studies that we've done show that something around two-thirds of woodland owners have some involvement with firewood uh, it might be for an occasional um uh, ambiance fire in the fireplace might be because it's the primary source of heat might be commercial sale of firewood but it's a it's a common thing to do um, i've given a webinar on firewood and you'll learn from that if you want to go search that out all trees are not equal you want to dry it uh, and then if you're working with others pick those partners judiciously maple syrup is a nice Another thing to do, it's a tangible output from the woods. It's unique to the Northeast, makes great gifts. Another option that's scalable, you can tap one or two trees or you can tap 20,000 trees. You can start small and then expand. There's an enormous variety of educational resources that are available. Um, Cornell has what's known as the Cornell Maple Program. They work closely with the New York State Maple Producers Association. Other states have extension education programs related to maple syrup production. And you can get involved through, you know, you can go whole hog and buy an evaporator and boil sap, or you might sell sap, or you might just lease your trees. If you're interested in this, Cornell in New York has annually has their Cornell Maple. Gourmet mushrooms, lots of different ways to grow uh, gourmet mushrooms. Uh, the option for totems on the left or the cribbing on the right, often used, as I understand it, to grow different types of mushrooms. But it's a fun thing that you can do. This, when we think about small parcels, you can see the scale of this could be on an acre of ground. So you don't need to, you don't need to be a big parcel owner to enjoy some some homegrown mushrooms. And there's a lot of resources on the internet about this as well. Custom sawmilling is fun. So if you have some trees that die, and I've got a friend of mine that he has a woodlot, he now has a sawmill, but for many years he would just pull out a couple of trees that they would die and he would bring in a sawmill and for a day and they would saw some boards and he would stack the lumber and and use it as he saw fit or share it with others or 
whatever. So there's a lot of different ways. If you hire this in, you can pay by the board foot. You can pay by the hour. Know if you're bringing in a if you're bringing in a Sawyer, make sure you know what they want. You want the log stacked in a certain location in a certain way. Figure that out so that they can be um, they can be uh, productive when they arrive. If you're in New York, or even if you're not, you're interested in this. There's going to be a kind of portable saw, uh, portable saw milling workshop on October 5th. So I'm calling it tree to table. I think the point here is that the trees, the, the lumber that's going to be used as hardwood is going to be hosted at a, at a woodland owner. That's also a high end custom furniture maker trained, like literally trained to do this. Uh, so if you want information on that coordinated co-court co-host with the New York Forest Owners Association, but send Brett Chedzoy, BJC226 at cornell.edu a note, and he'll put you on the list. So review your objectives. Focus on one output initially. Get involved. So I live, I'm listing New York organizations. Many of you are from Maine. I know the small woodland owners of Maine and other states have similar kinds of groups. So get involved with those. Go on woods walks. What a great chance to legally walk in somebody else's property and steal their good ideas. So that just doesn't get any better than that. Some of you may be interested in having a timber sale. But that's not for everyone. So forest harvest means you're cutting trees. Sale part means that you have timber, a product, either saw timber or pulpwood that you can sell. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Um, and this really needs to be something more than just cutting some trees. So this is not this is not the the tail wagging the dog. This is a tool, a means to an end. In the big picture, you've got some current objective. You're trying to optimize financial output and protect the future potential of your forest. So there's no standardized process. We do fair amount of timber harvesting here at the Cornell's are not research and teaching forest and every sale is a little bit different. We do maybe one sale every 18 months. If you're working with a potentially very high value product, you want to make sure you're fairly compensated for that. For most woodland owners, it's infrequent. So maybe you did it 20 years ago and you've probably forgotten some of those details. You want to make sure you sell this and harvest it so the sale isn't the problem. The harvesting is what could potentially put your next crop of trees at risk. So make sure you're talking with your forester. Confirm that the cutting is consistent with your ownership objectives and ask the question, which of my objectives is this benefiting? And if the forester can't give you a good answer, then either get a different forester or uh, rethink your objectives or rethink why you're having to harvest. The harvest is going to involve a landowner, a logger, and the forester. And in some cases, the public either expects or forces an involvement through social licensing and municipal ordinances. So that all varies. You certainly want to have a timber sale contract. Uh, your contract will ultimately be reviewed by your lawyer. It may also be reviewed by the buyer's lawyer. You want to have an opening section that talks about who's who and describes the location of the property and the timber. There are going to be terms of the sale, so the duration of the contract, the payment schedule, description of the timber that's for sale, what forestry practices are going to happen, BMPs, operational details, things like that. Um, you're going to probably have some section on insurance. And then if there are terms that you're uncertain about, make sure that those are defined within the contract. There are lots of examples of these. Your forester has one. You can get one from anywhere. Make sure, though, that your attorney uh, reviews this. Uh, if you don't have one or if you want to see some different variants, then just do a Google, Google search for timber sale contract. So review your plan with your forester. Talk about why you might want to have a harvest. Talk about the desired in outcomes. And then communicate. That's the biggest thing is talk to your foresters, talk to the loggers, 
uh, go out and visit with them, chat with them, develop a relationship, go out and walk in the woods with them, have them explain why they're doing what they're doing. I mean, this is a very cool process. So go learn about it and educate yourself. So to wrap this up, um, first and foremost, be safe. It's, you know, you don't, you, you have your woods because you want to do fun things in it. And if you get severely injured or you get dead, then your ability to have fun in the woods is going to be impaired. So develop a plan and prioritize those activities. I mean, part of your plan could be that you want to walk all of the trails at least once a month. Right. That's a that's an observational effort. And you might ordinarily do that, but it's also just a great way if if you're somebody that likes to check a box, you've got a to-do list and you uh, receive gratification by checking that box and make sure you say, all right, I'm gonna go walk all of the trails on my property at least once a month or once a quarter or once a season or whatever it is. Work cooperatively where it's advantageous. A lot of times you don't have all the equipment that you need, or it's just nice to spend time in the woods with other people where you share a common bond. So think about ways that you might work cooperatively. Educate yourself. Doing that here, you're hopefully you've learned something or got some new ideas or reinforced some ideas. And there's a lot more that all of us can learn. So everybody can always learn something more. And I've seen that there's an enormous amount of uh, interaction in the chat window. So I'm looking forward to opening that up. Um, so you're all sharing across, you know, your interests and expertise and geographies and enjoy yourself, right? Go out and have fun with it and take your time. Most of this, you don't have to, you don't have to hurry through it. And if you take your time, you can enjoy it. You can learn the ecology of the system as you're working it. You can think about how to be more efficient, how to be more safe, and how to be more productive. Um, so in the in the description of this webinar, I provided a link to a fact sheet. I've got a couple, two or three dozen of those. So if you go to my website, which is forestconnect.info, the top of that home page, there's a button that says popular educational resources. If you click on that, it will give you a dot, a drop down for a, something that's called, you know, now I forget what it's called. So if you just click on it, it takes you to one page. If you just hover over it, it'll take you something like um, articles for educators or something like that. That's where you have both a fact sheet and that fact sheet is also repackaged as a Microsoft Word document with pictures and captions. So if you're looking for a newsletter content and it's an educational purpose, then feel free to pull those out and, and use them. There's lots more help. So in New York, I mean, I work in New York, so these are our New York resources. We got trained volunteers. We have great relationship with the um, Woodland Forest Owners Association, NIFOA.org, Maple Producers, New York Nut Growers. Um, there's probably a Mushroom Growers Association, and my guess is that every state has the same mix of networks and organizations. On the Forest Connect YouTube page, I've given a listing of just some of the topics that have come up in over the years, so feel free to go to that youtube.com slash forest connect. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to expand. Let's see if I can do this. Expand the chat window. Wow, you all have been busy. That's good. So I'm just going to skim through this and look for, I'll go back to the beginning. And we'll just hit on questions as they came up. So I would, I think you all can, uh, you all could see all these chat options if they were um, 
they were sent to everyone. So feel free to scroll back. I think you can, if you can save them, feel free to save them. If you can't, I will certainly save them and send me a, send me a note and I'll send you a, a text file of these. So I was talking about foresters, greenest. Yes, I'm, my my flaw here that in New York, soil and water conservation districts also many of them have foresters on staff. Um, so getting a state forester or other government programs with small woodlots can be a challenge. Oftentimes, you may want to start and Drew as one of the master forest owner volunteers, but if you get an MFO involved, they can help you get started. It may be that uh, some states, they may have a lower acreage threshold, and it's a matter of getting onto their calendar and scheduling their time um, to come visit with you. All right, Nate. Thank you, Nate. Clarifies New York State Forest Tax Laws. Creation of a required forest management plan is paid for by the owner. Teresa also mentions DEC forestry offices, private service foresters for free, and they can answer tax law questions. Uh, Bill, thank you. Some states have licensing requirements for foresters. New York does not. Um, and some foresters are certified by SAF. There are, I'll call you, I mean, New York, I know I've written about kind of the different working with, there's I have an article called Working with Foresters, and it goes into a lot of that kind of information. But there are different states have different ways that foresters are licensed and the credential that's required to call yourself a forester. Okay, Linda wants to know why we're calling out natives. So, um, so I talked about two different kinds of natives. I've talked about natives that were desirable. I talked about natives that could be interfering. So, the native plants that are problematic and invasive plants. So, an invasive by definition is problematic and it's non-native. So, I use the umbrella term interfering because I'm not so much worried about whether it's a native or a non-native. What I'm worried about is whether it interferes with an ownership objective. Uh, Tim points out that, um, especially so if you're having trouble getting a service forester to come for free, you may, you may want to get a hold of a consulting forester and you're not going to put them perhaps on retainer, but for some nominal fee, they could come out and spend an hour walking around in your woods with you. Uh, right. The scientific name for Japanese barberry is... Berberus thunbergii. So David points out that there are some common some sharing about beech bark disease, which was a disease that came into northeastern U.S. Um, let's say in the 60s or 70s. And there are trees that are um, resistant to, so they do not get the full impact of beech bark disease. But now those are probably, that's a different genetic advantage than um, what might protect them from beech leaf disease. So it's a potentially a one-two punch that could be really devastating. And and beech has beech is a challenge because of the disease. There's there's at least a couple of webinars on managing beech. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's a bad plant. It's really there's some very cool things about it, and it would be really unfortunate to lose it.
So Jono's going to be planting two three-year-old tree seedlings this spring. And so if root dip is recommended, so I'm not sure about that. Um, I would say it's not necessary, but I don't know that. All right, Matt, there's a, there's a speaker. Recommendation for beech leaf disease. Thank you. So Freda is giving some alternatives to crop tree management, I'm guess, guessing wildlife tree management, ecosystem tree. All right, Carl's, Carl's offering an alternative to the idea of root dipping, suggesting using some mycorrhizal mixture. Oh, great, thank you. Bill, EPA webinar on December 5th about beech leaf disease. Okay, lots of comments there about how to manage for ticks and what, how to do that. Matt has a great idea. Thank you. Uh, consider using GPS tracking app with your smartphone. You get things like Onyx or Gaia GPS, way to photo locate interesting features. We had uh, two speakers. Um, one of them was on Jim Liebram uh, from uh, Warren County, you know, Washington. <laughs> Sorry, Jim. I forget which county you're from. Eastern Eastern Adirondacks Soil and Water Conservation District, Washington. And uh, on using GIS and GPS and technology to map your property. So go back and look for those in the Forest Connect YouTube site. Those are great, great um, resources. I've gone back in and rewatched them and taken notes when I've gone out to do tracking and, and mapping for harvest and things like that. Just trying to skim here. You guys, lots of input. I appreciate that. So I go back and I reread these. I hope that you all will take the time to do that. All right. Ricky says, can you go into specifics to what topics your PDF attached to the webinar invite? Or the volume per acre for small ones required for sale, specific cost landings, cut skid moving costs, et cetera, when to involve your neighbor's parcels in your next timber sale. Um, Ricky, that's a great question. Let me think if I can do it justice in without giving a like full on lecture. So you need to have a what might be considered an operable cut for you to entice a logger to show up and that's some of that there's two parts of that one um so this is if you're looking at the timestamps. this came in at 103 the question was can you go into specifics to what topics in your pdf um or here we, where we were talking about the the potential for timber harvesting on small parcels what's required for a sale so First of all, go and watch. There's at least two or three webinars on timber sales. So I've given one. Dave Apsley out of Ohio, as I recall, gave one. And I'm thinking that uh, somebody else did. Ben Spong from West Virginia gave one on timber harvesting in general, not about the sale per se. So you need to have an operable cut, so enough volume or value for the logger to look at this and say, 
worth it for me to spend a thousand or two thousand dollars or whatever it is going to cost to move my equipment around. So just you know, to bare bare bones, if the value is less than what it's going to cost to move the equipment in, it's there's you know it's, it, it'd be hard to argue for that. A second thing is that the the loggers are thinking about opportunity cost, and they can say, all right, I'm going to spend it's going to take me couple of days to get everything moved over there a couple of days to get everything set up i'm going to spend a couple of you know days or a couple of weeks on the ground and if i do that and i miss out on some other bigger job where the profit margin is better or where whether i can stay in place longer and so i minimize my costs more so the loggers are thinking about this and the opportunities as well so that's why working with a forester that knows the loggers that knows the feasibility is going to be advantageous to help you set realistic expectations. There will have to be, so the, 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 the layout of your property will dictate if there's any costs associated with putting in the landings, usually not. Uh, depending upon how you sell it would dictate whether or not you're going to pay for cutting and skidding or whether that's bundled up within the, the purchase agreement they usually they aren't going to charge you typically for moving costs but you are you end up absorbing those costs in some fashion so whether or not you involve your neighbors parcel so involve the neighbor not so much first the neighbor then the neighbor's parcel in a if you have a timber sale that might give you that operable cut but the logger is probably going to have to negotiate individually with everybody involved have different contracts and you're going to make sure you're going to need somebody like a forester that's going to be thinking through how all this flows together so hopefully that gets at what you were asking Freda says can't see the menu for chat Lots of links shared. So I haven't seen any links yet, Freda, but if I see them, I can push them out to everybody. Bruce says, what's about horse logging? Is it financially feasible? And what are the advantages and disadvantages? So great question. So is it financially feasible? Um, I'll say yes, but I can't say that I... I guess I do know a couple of people that do uh, horse logging. So they're going to be, you know, horses is, you know, horse logging is probably going to focus on, they're not going to be dragging out a lot of low value material, probably. Um, the advantages and disadvantages, the advantages, there's an aesthetic there. There is the smaller pathway that the horse is going to need. So if you have a skidder, you might need a 12 foot skid trail. If you have a horse, it could get by with something less than 12 feet wide. The disadvantage though, is when you have a skidder, uh, whether it's a particularly a grapple skidder, you, you can control kind of where those trees are going. You still can't do tight corners, but the, you can go on a diagonal the woods or kind of on the contour if you're doing that with a horse you may end up with that log rolling down the hill unless you have already cleared or, or cut in a skid trail so um i my sense is that it's not commonly available logging system and so i haven't uh, i mean i've never seen for example i've never seen a commercial operation i've seen a lot of commercial mechanized operations i've never seen a commercial horse logging so if there's somebody in your area that would do it go watch them work and and then look for those advantages and disadvantages okay jose wants to know if there's anything being done about lantern fly yes act so actually in two months we've got a presentation on lantern fly so I'd say, wait, uh, we'll learn more in a couple of months. Oh, great. Teresa's 
talks about some horse logging on state land. Thank you. Carl has it. Great. Uh, Fred wants to know if there's any advice for forest owners facing extensive regeneration deficit or suppression of invasives and beech bark. So if you've got those, as I said, if you've got invasive plants and interfering plants, you probably have a deer problem. So before, I would say before you go spending a nickel on managing interfering plants, figure out how you're going to effectively control the impacts of deer. We use, so hunting, recreational hunting is, uh, I'm going to say is a challenge to make that work in a way consistent that you're going to limit the impacts of deer. There are a lot of discussions about hunting regulation changes and market hunting and more licenses and a lot of these things that are kind of a, have a human dynamic built into it, which makes them potentially more complicated and a, a longer time horizon for success. So what we did, we talked about this last month in the webinar was we built slash walls and those are effective. So that's how we got, that's how we controlled the impact, not by, by controlling the deer browsing, but by, well, yeah, but not by controlling the deer population, but by controlling the possibility of deer to browse. Catherine wants to know if anything this about um, the hemlock only delgid. So the state is partnering with Cornell for through the hemlock initiative. Mark Whitmore, who's the director of that, is going to be talking later in the year, I think in November. He's working on biocontrol agents. Stay tuned for that. Okay, there's several others. Teresa and Derek have commented for Catherine. All right. Matt points out. Uh, Association of Consulting Foresters, great resource, uh, good for forest practitioners. All right, you all have been wonderful. This was a fun conversation. I appreciate that very much. You stuck around well past the one o'clock bewitching hour, and uh, I thank you for that. I learned a lot from your comments, and I'm gonna I'm gonna save those comments so that I can do that now. So that save chat so um thank you appreciate the tips you give me some good ideas on beech leaf disease and i'll be looking to get a beech leaf specialist and i've almost got my 2024 agenda of speakers completed when i do i'll send that around so that you can you can make sure you set aside those the third wednesday of the month for your topics so hope you all have a good afternoon I'll be back again live at 7 p.m. You'll hear pretty much the same thing, but you're welcome back. Enjoy your day.